Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm very excited about our next guest. We have Miyoko Shinner joining us, the founder of Miyoko's Creamery. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Vegetrepreneur Summit. I'm happy to be here, Noah. So let's jump right in. Can you give us a little bit of background, maybe some context for those that don't know you as well? Uh, how did you get to where you are today and what is it that you do? Sure, you know, I, I often joke that I'm an overnight success 30 years in the making. So I started out my first vegan business in the 1980s and have had a variety of uh, businesses in the food space over the years. Um, and back in the 1990s, I started a, a company that um, actually made uh, meat alternatives before they were popular. And uh, in fact, I was a, uh, a competitor to Tofurky. <laughs> so, oh, and we distributed them nationwide at you know, Whole Foods and stores like that. So. Um, even though a lot of people, you know, only got to know me after I started Miyoko's um, Creamery and, and started the, the vegan cheese revolution, as we often joke. Um, really, I've been working in the food industry uh, through businesses, cookbooks, uh, TV shows for a very, very long time, for almost four decades. <laughs> so. Can you talk a little bit about the early days of your Creamery? Sure, the early days, um, you know, well, it was funny, I was thinking about it because we're at almost 200 employees now and in the very, very beginning, um, I started out with about four or five and, um, you know, I was right in, it was just, we're going to have this little artisanal creamery, we we're going to have a little retail shop and the mountain bikers would come by and pick up a baguette and a wheel of cheese and go off and have a picnic. That was sort of the idea and then sort of e-commerce. Um, and, you know, and I was in there teaching everyone how to make cheese and I was in there getting my hands dirty and we were making these beautiful rounds. And I thought, oh, my God, one day we'll be able to make a thousand wheels in a week. <laughs> Just kind of funny because, you know, we make something like um, 10,000 cases a day now or something. So it's it's just. And we thought if we get to 30,000 wheels in one month, we'll break even. And it just it that sort of breaking even point just never came because the business just kept expanding so quickly. Um, so but in the early days, you know, I was in there making cheese. I was mopping floors, washing the dishes, uh, packing boxes, just, you know, uh, first time we got our, our we got into distribution just about three months after uh, we launched the company to get that first order out and, and make a pallet of product. You know, we were there until like 11 o'clock at night, wrapping wheels of cheese and pack, packing them in boxes. And it was pretty crazy. Um, you know, I have this, this problem when I get really, really stressed out, my left eye starts to twitch. And during those early days, my left eye was twitching like constantly. So it's, so what was the turning point in, in your entrepreneurial journey? When did you know that this was going to be a bigger company than maybe you had envisioned uh, at first? Well, I think the very first day we opened, you know, I mean, honestly, I didn't know, because if you think about it today, there's vegan cheese everywhere. Everyone's got a vegan cheese company. There's a million brands out, out now uh, at, in, at stores, but then in every you know, little town in the United, in, in the world, actually, I mean, I've been to little vegan cheese shops and, Hungary and Prague and, and places like that way off the beaten track. But, you know, everywhere there's a, a, an artisanal cheese maker making some beautiful vegan cheeses that you, nobody could find six years ago or seven years ago. Um, the idea of this category existing was unthought of a few years ago. And so when I started, I had no idea if there would be any interest at all. I mean, I, I you know, honestly, I was thinking like, who's going to buy this? I had no idea. The, 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 that the, the demand was so strong. So the very first day I realized that was when we went live on e-commerce. And it was right when we opened in September of 2014. And I thought, it'll be interesting to see how many orders we get. And by Monday morning, we had about $50,000 in orders. Uh, so we went live on a Friday afternoon. And by Monday morning, we had um, over 500 orders that were roughly about $100 each. And I thought, holy, you know what, <laughs> this this is getting real. Um, and uh, 
you know, within a month we had hired, I don't know, maybe 15 people to make cheese and no one was trained and no one knew what they were doing. It was just so chaotic. Within three months, um, we were in distribution in NorCal. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, you know, within a year, we were in national distribution and it just kept growing from there. Sounds like an overnight success story. Well, as I mentioned, 30 years in the making. So, you know, I'd, I'd had many <laughs> failures prior to that. And I think this is something that most, you know, first time entrepreneurs often don't know because we've seen all these success stories of these tech companies, you know, like Facebook or whatever, these young kids come out of college or maybe they're even in college and they start a company and, you know, overnight they're billionaires. Um, it just doesn't work like that most of the time. I mean, for every unicorn out there, there's, you know, probably a million uh, companies that have just flopped that you never heard of. And, and I think about this going to the Natural Products Expo, which is the biggest trade show in the industry. And because of COVID, you know, it didn't happen this year and likely it's not going to happen next year either. Um, but every time you go there, there are thousands of new companies, it seems. And they're usually on the third floor or at the Hilton Hotel. They're not the ones on the main floor getting the big booths, but you know, they've got the little booths and there are so many of them. And it's exciting uh, when you can find a company doing something that's really, really exciting and, and unique, but it's also kind of, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's sad because you know that a large percentage of them aren't gonna be there the following year. And that's sort of the reality. And it, that should not discourage people. I mean, I had so many failures. Don't think that just because I had lots of businesses before they were all successful. Most of my businesses were not financially successful at all. You know, maybe I was successful in some way. I got some notoriety or, uh, you know, I had a core audience that really liked the product or something like that. But uh, by no means were they financially successful. Um, you know, they were, I was stressed out. I worked many hours. Um, I made no money. Oftentimes uh, for something like six years, I didn't take a paycheck. I had to pay my employees, you know, because when you own a business and you're growing, you have to, first of all, make sure that the first thing you pay, you got to pay the rent, you got to pay your employees. Actually, you have to pay your employees first. It's, you know, payroll is, is a, uh, if you don't pay payroll, you can go to jail. So that's, um, that's a serious crime you must make sure that your people are taken care of um but i you know i was the last person to get paid and luckily i had other means um i was married at the time or at least part of the time so you know i had another paycheck um you know i had a roof over my head but i i certainly was not successful um for many years so i think you have to realize that as an entrepreneur that um Yes, there's a big risk. If you if you aren't willing to take the risk, you're not going to ever succeed. But at the same time, it is a risk, and there is a chance that things could go awry. As a I know that's long time. encouraging, but it's the truth. There's a delay. Is that okay? Between there is a delay, um, okay. a little bit on. I'm not sure if it's on your or my end. Okay. But I think we can manage. If not, we can go backstage and start the session again if it's a major issue for everyone. Let's see. It's only on my end. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay, so let's see. With, let's, yeah, let's keep going. Um, so as a, as a longtime um, activist, uh, animal activist, how do you view entrepreneurship as a vehicle for bringing about change? Sure. I think we're, you know, we're at a point in history where businesses can't exist solely to make a profit. We're at a point where um, if you're going to go into business, go into business for a higher cause. Um, I think business is the platform uh, in order to make change today. You know, I think the, the, the time of just uh, activists going out in the street and screaming and holding signs, I mean, all of that works. But we have to make change at a fundamental economic level. Um, we have to change how consumers purchase products, the types of products they they consume. And, and it's absolutely critical that industry leads the charge in activism, in making a change to create uh, an equitable environment for workers, but to save the planet and to save all living beings on this planet. I mean, it's our responsibility. We screwed it up. Now we got to fix it. 
So you recently won a pretty major battle against the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Congratulations, by the way. And also how it impacts other entrepreneurs who follow in your footsteps? Sure. Um, we um, just won, well, we won a uh, preliminary injunction against the state of California for um, so that they can't take action against us for uh, using the word butter. Um, last year, we received a letter from them telling us that we had to cease and desist from the use of the word butter, that we had to remove all images of animals off of our website. We had a picture of a woman hugging a cow on our website because what we're trying to do is uh, re remove the image of animals as commodities or uh, as being simply for our needs, uh, but to um, to uh, instill in people the idea that, that animals are lovable. Animals are, you know, cows can be pets. Cows can be, are capable of love and of giving love. So we wanna change the perspective of how we look at farmed animals. And so we have all these images of farmed animals on our website, interacting with people, receiving love, et cetera. Um, and we thought that was really, really important. And all of a sudden we were told that only the livestock industry had the right to use images of livestock. We thought that was really, really wrong. And we felt that our butter was butter. And were we to call it a different name, um, people would be confused by how they're supposed to use it. So instead of backing down, as did many other companies in California, many plant-based companies before ours had received similar letters from the state of California telling them they couldn't use the word cheese or butter or whatever. And most of them simply complied because they didn't want to go to battle. We felt that this is right now is is when the the food revolution is happening that is absolutely critical that we drive a new uh that we start driving in 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 uh you know we have to uh uh drive the momentum to create a new food economy and we felt that it was absolutely critical that someone had to stand up to the state and we decided we would do that so we were able to partner with animal legal defense fund um who gratefully provided um uh, uh, pro bono services for us. And um, we went to battle with the state of California um, and we won the preliminary injunction. Um, we are set to go to trial next year, um, but until the trial, they can't do anything. And uh, we may not go to trial. Um, it looks like, you know, the state may just back down. Um, what this means is that it sets a precedent for plant-based businesses in the dairy space to feel okay about using the word butter or cheese, et cetera. And we're beginning to see that throughout the space now. I can tell you, you know, three or four years ago, no one used the word butter, except for us. Um, people use words like plant-based spread or coconut oil spread or or buttery buttery spread or or things like that. And we we just boldly called it vegan butter. And now others are doing things. Uh, you know, Upfields, makers of Country Crock have their new plant butter, for example. And, you know, as we think about the future, I, I do believe that animal agriculture will come to an end. Um, just like th there's a white paper that was written by uh, a, a, a think tank called Rethink X, and they predict that animal agriculture will collapse by 2035. Um, and I actually believe that, and that's for economic reasons. But until then, we're going through this sort of flexion, inflection point where we're going to have animal ag and we're going to have what I call plant ag or plant dairy. So I think dairy has to be redefined as coming from two sources, animals and plants. So we consider ourselves plant dairy, manufacturers of plant dairy. And we want people in the space to start thinking that way. We don't want people to say, well, I'm afraid. And so I'm just gonna call my product buttery spread or you know, it's not butter or something like that. Um, we have to band together and have a, a singular voice if we're going to fight um, the status quo and the incumbent industry. In order to do so, we have to be proud of what we're making and not be afraid to use words like dairy and creamery and butter and cheese. How do we help existing traditional animal agriculture um, transition over to plant-based? I know you have an incredible program called the uh, Farm Conversion Operation, where you help dairy farmers convert over to creating plant-based um, ingredients. Can you talk a little bit yes. about how vegpreneurs can work with existing industries to bring about a plant-based future? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, we think this is part of the transition. I mean, I'm not, you know, I live in uh, agricultural land and I'm surrounded by dairy farms. So I drive by a number of dairy farms on the way to work every single day. And uh, I can tell you right now about three of them are for sale, right, on my way to work. Um, because dairies aren't doing very well. We actually had um, an activist, uh, we just had a, a big protest out at a dairy farm that resides on Point Reyes National Seashore public lands last uh, last Sunday, and I spoke to the, the farmer himself, and he says, you know, he's not getting the same price for milk anymore. Ten years ago, organic milk was the big thing, and today he can't even get conventional prices for organic milk. I mean, the whole industry is collapsing. We saw the collapse of two major dairies last year, Dean Foods and Borden, and, and, the, and I think, you know, the writing is on the wall for dairy farmers. They're all struggling. Are they evil people? No. I mean, I know a lot of dairy farmers uh, and many of them are small time farmers who have been doing this for generations. You know, sometimes they're a third, fourth generation farmer and that's all they know. They have no idea how to make uh, a living other than doing what they're doing. And many of them are scared because their industry is collapsing. Their dairy is not doing very well and they're wondering, you know, what's going to become of my life? Am I going to lose my land? And many of them are losing their lands. They're going bankrupt. They're committing suicide at an all-time high. At all -time high. It's, it's just really, really, it's sort of sad. Um, and so what we want to do is help them see the light, that we're not the enemy, we're the solution, and that they can remain a dairy farmer, but they're going to be growing crops instead of, you know, they can say, I'm still a dairy farmer. Now I'm making milk from cashews or I'm making milk from oats because cashews don't grow in the United States. You have, they only grow in tropical climates. So that was a bad example, but, but basically they can remain, they can now become a plant dairy farmer instead of an animal dairy farmer. And they can grow crops that will become part of our supply chain or the supply chain of other companies. And this is how we can show the industry that it's time to make a change that and if we can get more and more dairy farmers to convert that's going to further precipitate the decline of animal dairy which is exactly what we want to do maybe can you comment on starbucks currently testing your cream cheese at one of their locations and how important you see products like yours being used by again, bigger chains um, so that it becomes more mainstream. Sure. We're really, really excited about that. Um, that opportunity came to us. They reached out to us and uh, we developed two plant-based, um, two uh, cream cheeses for them, um, flavors that they requested. Um, they've actually, they're, what they're trying to do is test a new program where they're just going to, um, instead of carrying multiple bagels, they're just going to go to a plain bagel and then they have different toppings. And at this one store in near Seattle, in Issaquah, um, they transitioned to only having uh, one dairy cream cheese plain and then two plant, two of our cream cheeses. So we have a cinnamon ra raisin and an everything. Um, so it's just a one store test to see how they perform. Um, and if they perform well, there's an opportunity for us to go to a regional test of several hundred stores or even go nationwide. So we think that's really important. Um, Starbucks is committed to going 50% plant-based within the next couple of years. So it's a huge initiative for them and they see, uh, and they're doing that for environmental reasons. Uh, they are, you know, they, they've seen, they've read the studies, they know that going plant-based is one of the most important things you can do um, to reverse climate change and they feel that they need to do that. So this is just a first step. Um, I think it's really, really exciting. Um, we're really, really thrilled. And uh, gosh, if you're near Seattle, please go check it out. Let us know how you liked it. It's super exciting. Congratulations. So what opportunities do you see in the market for entrepreneurs getting into the plant-based dairy space now? Sure. I think ingenuity um, and uh, you know, coming up with something slightly unique, always look for that white space, always look for what's not there already. For example, there's a million slices and shreds on, on in the marketplace. Um, but, uh, you know, there isn't a lot of artisanal cheese that's mass produced, for example. So there's definitely an opportunity there. There, You know, since I launched the company six years ago, there are so many artisanal cheeses that are local. 
um, you know, selling at farmers markets or to a handful of stores. So there's an opportunity for some of those to grow and and take uh, market share away from from me, for example, or actually just ex or actually not from me, but from animal dairy. And that's how we have to think about it. Is that you know sometimes people say, oh, the plant-based cheese category is getting too crowded. But the fact of the matter is, if you think of other plant-based companies as being the um, your competitors, yeah, it is getting crowded. But what we have to do is think about um, not that space as as not them as being the the competitors, but animal dairy. Ultimately, we want to move into the animal dairy set and and take that category that you know take market share away from them. In order to do that, we can't do it with just you know BioLife, Daya, Follow Your Heart, and Miyoko's. Um, and a handful of other companies. We need many, many more companies to enter this, the, the space to provide this, the wide selection, the selection and breadth um, of uh, products that consumers are going to want. Um, also, I think there's space to explore um, ingenious new ways of making these products. If you think about the the major players in the marketplace right now, which are like Daya and Follow Your Heart and BioLife and so on. Um, most of them make products that are really not, I, I don't know, a lot of omnivores say, well, it's not really food. Vegan products are highly processed because most of those products truly are highly processed. They're made out of oil and starch and with natural flavorings in them. And so I think to convert the flexitarian and the omnivore that's looking to go more plant-based, um, what they're looking for is uh, what I would call more real food. And so I hear this all the time from flexitarians and omnivores. It's like I would eat vegan foods, but I look at the, I read the ingredients and, you know, the ingredients are just as bad as other processed foods. And I'd rather drink that, you know, organic dairy product because I know it's come, it's all organic and it's real food. Now we may think about it differently as vegans, but that's how they're thinking about it, how non-vegans are thinking about it. So we have to start thinking about how can we win them over? And we're not gonna win them over with more processed food. We're only gonna win them over with real foods that are organic, that people read the ingredients and they know what those ingredients are. Is there a product that you wish was available on the market right now that you haven't seen done or not done well? Um, well, yes. I mean, first of all, I, I think the whole slice and shred category uh, most of them, you know, are are not done well. Um, they're because they're not healthy. And in fact, um, we we had an, we made an attempt. This is one of our little stumbling blocks. Um, we launched a, a cheddar and pepper jack earlier this year. Um, and there were a lot of compromises made to launch that product. And uh, you know, and I don't like them either. We we've reformulated them. We're going to have a new product out in a couple of months, hopefully by mid November, early December totally reformulated uh, cheddar that's made from real food, um, made out of uh, legumes and hemp seeds and, and oats. Um, but other than us, most of the products, as I mentioned, are oil and starch. And I think we need to improve that. We need to improve that category. Um, you know, our product, plant-based products, vegan products should have nutrition. They should have protein and calcium and other nutrients. They shouldn't just be about it doesn't have uh, cholesterol or it doesn't have this. We can't be, we can't build an economy on not having, we have to build economy that is full of abundance, that is full of nutrients, that is full of flavor. Um, we can't just be good enough. We're not gonna be good enough ever just by saying it doesn't have this, that, or the other thing. What traits uh, do you think are most vital for an entrepreneur to succeed in this industry? And we can talk about maybe plant-based dairy. What attributes are necessary? I think, um, you know, really the ability, I mean, just for any entrepreneur, whether it's the dairy industry or anything else, is that will, that willingness to, to stick with it, um, willingness, you know, the, the conviction to uh, believe in yourself and your product, um, but also to be realistic and, and make sure that that you've vetted, you've done some c consumer outreach, um, some market research to make sure that that uh, there's a need for that product. Um, and um, you know, once again, I can't stress enough the need to um, 
make real food. Um, I do. I have seen a few companies that are beginning to make uh, more nutritious versions of what's out there, and I commend them. Um, and the, the next key is going to be scaling. Um, you know, figuring out how do you scale the technology. Um, if you have a new technology, um, then it may or may not be easy to figure out how do you how do you scale in a big way? How do you commercialize it so that um, that you know you can reach people across the country? Some of the new technology doesn't have vetted uh, uh, scalability, and I know that's where entrepreneurs often struggle is that they don't know how to get from the bench top to you know being able to make a you know fill a a two thousand gallon tank with product or something. Um, and that's that's going to remain an issue as long as you know you, there's new technology that's never been vetted. How did you and how should entrepreneurs go about fundraising, raising money to start their venture or to grow it? Well, you know it, that that all depends on what you really want to do with your business. Um, are you trying to um, stay local, regional? Are you trying to get as big as you can? Um, you know, how fast do you want to grow? Um, do you want to be in business for the rest of your life? Or is this something you want to grow and then sell? I think entrepreneurs need to start thinking about, you know, what is, what do you want to do with your business? Because a lot of people start businesses and it's a lifestyle business. They want, because they like it. And if you are a lifestyle business, it's going to be harder, for example, to raise capital. Um, Unless you know you, you're raising from family and friends that are also looking at looking at it as a lifestyle business, um, most um, institutional investors are interested in investing in companies that um, have big growth dreams and uh, you know want to expand their business significantly within a short period of time um, because they are looking to make a return on their investment. Um, and this is true. Less so, but it's still true even for vegan investors. And there are more and more people today that are exclusively or mostly investing in the plant-based space, but even them at the end of the day uh, need to make a return on their investment. They're not charities. Um, and the reason they need to make a return on that investment is so that they can now fuel even more businesses. Um, and so, you know, it's it's if you're not a business in business, sometimes they, you know, you they don't understand people don't understand that. Um, and but you know ultimately everyone has to make money at the end so we can change the economy. Um, so I think it's important for an entrepreneur starting out to um, spend some time thinking about why are you in business, and you know where where what's the end goal? Um, where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in ten years? Um, do I want to sell my business? Um, People want to know where I'm going oftentimes. And yes, I mean, at some point I have institutional investors, so I will have to sell my business um, or do an IPO potentially. But at some point, you know, I do want to cash out. And why do I want to do that? So I can invest in more vegan businesses, um, start a bigger sanctuary. Um, you know, it's not so I can, you know, buy my $20 million house and go swimming all day long. Um, so you know, I we have to use money for to advance uh, our activism. That's that's the purpose of all of this. Um, and so it, it, I think there's you know there's a lot of stuff in the media about oh my god that company sold out. Um, I saw a video recently where someone said there's only two plant-based companies that haven't sold out yet, and I was cited as one of them, and Tofurky was cited as the other. And, and that's wonderful, that's great. Um, but I think we really have to think about what does that really mean? Um, Tofurky has been around for th over 30 years and they've had a chance to, to grow um, organically. And you know they've never really had to take any money. They may have recently raised money, I'm not exactly sure, but you know it's a family owned business. And boy, if I, I wish I had been able to do that. I wish you know the company I started in the 1990s um, had survived and and uh, you know had turned into Miyoko's. That would be great. But the reality is, you know, um, climate change is very real. Animals are dying at a, uh, at a um, every single day by the billions. And if we're going to save them, then we have to make change fast. And so we have to think about 
how do we do that in, in, in the fastest way possible? I don't have the luxury of spending 30 years growing organically. I have to grow fast now so that our products can be everywhere so that we become a solution for people that want to transition and so that we can take market share away from animal products. So that's what we have to think about all the time. And we have to convince existing corporations, large conglomerates, large uh, food companies that the future for them isn't investing in more animal products, it's investing in, in veganism, in vegan products. And, and so, you know, when you think about all these companies, people are always criticizing uh, vegan companies taking money from, um, you know, from, I don't know, Unilever or or um, Upfields or um, let's, I'm trying to think of other companies that are big corporations, whether they're in plant-based or meat. Um, and so, uh, the fact is, they have the we, we have to realize they have the infrastructure to help these plant-based companies scale rapidly. They have the, the 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 manufacturing facilities, the distribution, the supply chain, and the and the financial resources to help these companies succeed and scale. And if you know if Tyson's investing in Beyond Meat. And next thing you know, the CEO of Tyson is saying, well, I, the future of, of protein could come easily, as easily from plants as from meat. Then you know you've created a mind shift within that corporation. And if they see that Beyond Meat is doing better than, uh, you know, than Tyson's chicken companies, um, then um, maybe they'll start putting more resources into plant-based. And eventually they'll put fewer resources into the meat companies or the dairy companies and they'll be you know it'll flip and i think we have to make change from within because these are the companies that have the resources and the infrastructure to help plant-based companies succeed we can be pure we can stay in our own little ecosystem and just sell to vegans but we're not going to change the world and the end of the world will come sooner than than we imagine so, you know, in some ways it seems like, yeah, we're, we're dating the devil or we're, we're playing with fire. But um, I think there is a huge amount of opportunity from, from partnering with some of these companies. So, um, yeah, I'm probably, you know, at some point, um, some, you know, if every time I post something like this, I get bashed. Like, oh, my God, you know, um, I, what an evil <laughs> thought. She's, she's uh, willing to talk to the other side. But, um, but, but I think that's how we make change, really. I, I really do. I, you know, there isn't, we have to convince these, these companies that um, their current practices aren't working. On that note, how do you, as you involve more stakeholders, uh, remain mission aligned? Like, how do, in, how do entrepreneurs bringing on investors ensure that sure. their company will always remain plan and they'll never be forced out or you know forced to do something that they wouldn't align with their mission well i think the most important re, uh, way of doing that is by being as successful as possible because people are following the investors are following the money um and so if you're successful and you do a really really good job why would they make you change they're gonna you know they're gonna want you to do more of what you're doing now i'll be very very honest um I make it very clear um, when I talk to somebody, when I talk to an investor, I actually say to them, I want you to know that I'm an animal rights activist and I'm doing this for the animals. And um, I make it very, very clear to them. I don't pussyfoot around and soften it up or anything like that. And, and so because of that, of course, we have vegan investors in us um, and, and I, we have you know some stakeholders that aren't entirely vegan but they believe in uh, for example one our obvious ventures one of our investors is trying to create what's called a world positive they, they they make world positive investments so they only make investments in companies that are making the world a better place and we have been so successful through our activism because of the way we do it and because of our products that our investors tell us to do more of it. They tell us to step up on the activism, um, you know, and talk, and, and talk about animals in the way that we are doing, you know, not in the angry vegan way, 
but in promoting compassion and caring and trying to change the world view about animals. So they actually encourage us to do that. And I've never had a single conversation, except for in the very early days, I think, you know, when I was talking to investors in the very, very early days, um, I was fortunate um, only to get vegan investors in my first round. They were all vegan. But after that, when I started talking to investors that were not vegan, I was afraid, you know, I felt like I had to sell myself rather than me interviewing them and getting them to sell me. Um, and so I sort of downplayed the activism, but immediately thereafter, I, as I became more comfortable with who we were as a company, um, you know, I just um, began to, um, I made sure that any an investor that called me knew who we were and why we existed and that they could never ever change us. Um, so, you know, there was an article, we were in a, an accelerator, um, with, partnering with Nestle for six months um, where we did some marketing things. And, and I got bashed in the vegan um, news people, you know, there was an article that came out um, in Live Kindly that said, um, you know, Miyoko's partners with Nestle in an accelerator and people immediately thought that we had been acquired by Nestle. Um, which was not true and that you know we were only in an accelerator working with them on some marketing initiatives and they they funded this focus uh, some consumer research research which we would not have been able to afford at the time so you know i i thank them for that but when we did that we got bashed by by vegans but what they don't know what vegans don't know is when they first called me up out of the blue i said to them so why are you calling me did you know that I'm an animal rights activist and I have serious concerns about you? And what they said to me was, that's exactly why we're calling you, because we know you're authentic and we're trying to figure out how to become a better corporation. We want to get back to the roots of where we, how we first started. And they had felt like they had steered, they had gotten off course. Now, you know, I don't know, maybe this is corporate speak. I have no idea. but. You know, I won't talk to anyone who isn't genuine, who doesn't seem genuine to me about their concerns about uh, the current, the status quo of the world and what we need to do to change it. And I can tell you that so many investors today um, and corporations, big corporations are concerned and are realizing the need to do social good. In fact, an article came out showing that doing social good is more important to investors today than um, almost anything else. So investors are looking for companies that are doing social good. I know it sounds crazy, but, and there's a lot of skeptics out there, but it really is true. And I can tell you that from speaking to so many uh, institutional investors. I have a question about the differences you found marketing um, your products, have you tried out vegan versus plant-based versus dairy-free? And what advice do you have for founders who are labeling their products right now? Sure. Um, you know, so I personally think the word plant-based is very confusing. Um, you know, we're finding products that are called plant-based that actually have egg whites in them or, you know, or whatever. And so um, we have used the word vegan. Um, but we're making a switch in what we call our products now. Um, for example, you know, if you go to the milk category, the fluid milk category, there's almond milk, oat milk, uh, et cetera. So they call it by the primary ingredient. And so uh, we're launching, we're relaunching some packaging where it, the product will say cashew milk cheese. Uh, so it'll call out the, the primary ingredient uh, that we're using. Uh, in cases where there is a composite ingredient, we'll just stick with vegan or, you know, oat and legume milk butter or something like that. Um, I think the word vegan, um, you know, there's plenty of studies that show the word vegan is a turnoff. Uh, at the same time, there's plenty of uh, surveys out there that show the words plant-based is very, very, is more confusing to consumers than the word vegan. So at the end of the day, I think you stick up uh, for what you believe in. Um, we continue to use the word vegan, not plant-based, because 
um, I think the world needs to be phenomenally vegan. And we're trying to change perception, uh, consumer perception about what vegan means. Um, if we stop using, if we live in fear of words like vegan, the world will never be vegan. And so, you know, you, we just have to stop being afraid and, and you have to be able to be bold enough to, to speak your truth and stand up for what you believe in. All right, let's move over to uh, some audience questions. You mentioned the businesses you had prior to Miyoko's Creamery. What lessons did you learn from those? Uh, oh gosh, um, a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I learned to, uh, Gosh, uh, that, that's a whole seminar unto itself. But I think the biggest uh, thing I learned is that you can't just be an entrepreneur, you have to be a leader. So, uh, you know, that's the problem with a lot of entrepreneurs. It's not just about the product. It's about how you can lead and inspire a team of people. Um, and that's something that has taken me a long time to, to learn, uh, to develop into that I'm continually evolving into. Um, it's not like I got there and all of a sudden, um, you know, so, so I think that's one thing. Um, running a company isn't just about the product and selling it. It's about uh, the culture of the company, creating uh, an environment where people want to come to work. Um, it's about how you take care of them. Um, you know, it, it, when I first started, all I thought, you know, it's like, how am I going to pay rent? You know, I mean, I was just beset with all these problems. Um, and, um, I think a lot of companies, whether they're vegan or non-vegan, um, often forget that you have to take care of the stakeholders, um, the people that are coming to work every day and give them a reason for coming to work every day. That means you've got to create a business plan that's going to allow you to, um, take care of them, pay a, a living wage and provide benefits and PTO and, um, you know, everything else that they need to, to feel like they can work for you. Um, I think you have to do market research, understand the consumer uh, for your product, but at the same time, anticipate the future that may not be reflected in the consumer research. Um, there's a lot. I mean, I could I could talk about that exclusively for an hour. Yeah, totally. Um, before we go to the next one, I'm curious, what's next for me? What are you, what do you have planned? What are you working on? It's exciting. Sure. Right now uh, we have been in this, we have a new technology that we've developed or we are in the current, uh, currently developing. Um, that's really, really interesting. Um, so I, I can't say a whole lot about it right now, but it, it's a way for us to, to make cheese out of just about any kind of plant-based milk. Um, so that's going to be coming out in a couple of years. Um, we have some new and exciting products coming out next year as well too. Um, hopefully if, if all goes well, we'll have uh, feta and we'll have cottage cheese and some other products. Um, but in the last few months, um, I have stepped back into the role of head of R&D. Um, I felt that our products were going in the wrong direction um, and um, becoming I think overly simplified and dumbed down. Um, and um, I was very unhappy with that direction. So I've stepped back into um, the head of the research and development role and we spent the last few months reformulating uh, the cheddar cheese, for example, reformulating the mozzarella, which um, over the last two or three years since we scaled had sort of gone down in quality and um, I've been very unhappy about it. So I reformulated that. And we're going to be um, reformulating some other products as well, too, that I felt had been impacted. Um, our cream cheese as well, too. Um, you know, one of the problems is when you're making a fermented live product and, and you scale, um, you can have problems with with uh, with the, uh, the bacteria, um, over acidification, et cetera. So there was just a lot of things that we needed to fix. And so instead of working on new innovation, we spent the last few months really just fixing the old, um, which sounds like a kind of, you know, could be like a waste of time, the product's selling, so why fix it? Well, because I want to I want to be proud of what I'm selling. I want to make the best products possible. So over the next few months, we're hoping to relaunch 
uh, some of our existing products as better versions that I hope will satisfy the mar you know, will satisfy every consumer out there. What is your relationship with some of the other plant-based uh, dairy manufacturers? Do you see them as competition? No, I think they're, I mean, you know, yeah, I did. I, so just, just to be clear, uh, I, I wasn't trying to be disparaging by saying that most of the, the slices and shreds were oil and, and starch. I mean, it's, it's um, it, this is where, you know, I think vegan companies need to really start thinking about um, not going down the processed food route, but um, I think they play a role in helping to take market share away from animal products. Um, I'm a member of the Plant-Based Foods Association, and um, I'm very close to uh, many of these other plant-based dairy companies. Um, we're all trying to make change together. There's room for everybody. Um, we, you know, what started out as just, let's say, three or four shelves a few years ago has grown into an entire door or maybe two doors. At, at natural in, in, in a number of company a number of stores and retailers and we have to just keep expanding that space we have to get to a point where um, you know we take over we're we're no longer um, relegated to the produce section but in the dairy section taking market share away from animal foods and so we need more plant-based dairy companies That's awesome. Um, let's take another audience question. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you are seeing as you grow exponentially? What are the challenges and opportunities? Um, you know, the challenge is, I think, uh, scaling, manufacturing. I mean, I think that's a big challenge for a lot of companies right now, um, because unless you can raise millions of dollars to build your own plant, um, and that takes time as well too. Most plant-based companies are gonna find what are called co-packers. You can find someone else to make your product for you. Um, and there's a lot of challenges uh, trying to you know, find one that may be able to do your technology, whatever that is. Um, and so getting, getting to the marketplace is gonna be a challenge. You know, getting, just being able to scale and make your product is gonna be a challenge. Another pro uh, big challenge during the pandemic is getting shelf space for a startup because in the old days you could actually you know go door to door to retailers or go to the natural products expo and exhibit your product and that and but today um, retailers are often cutting back on new innovation they only want to stock the tried and true because retail uh, consumers are going into stores uh, grabbing whatever they can and then they're they're getting out of there so there's not as much opportunity for new companies to be seen. So you know you're going to have to find innovative ways to get your product known to the consumer. And so I think that the opportunity for that is um, is is direct to consumer and building a robust perishable or non-perishable uh, direct to consumer business. Um, people are now buying foods online, uh, much more so after the, you know, since the pandemic than prior to the pandemic. So I think there's huge opportunities there. So my last question, Ventrepreneur is trying to inspire as many entrepreneurs and investors to grow plant-based companies. How do we inspire more entrepreneurs, more investment into this space? Well, you know, just think of it as a platform for activism, the most effective platform for activism. So if you're a, a vegpreneur, if you're an entrepreneur in the plant-based space um, and uh, you're, you're trying to save the animals, then it's, uh, it's a moral obligation for you to start the business. Love that. Thank you so much, Miyoko. There were so many more questions and so many people are, are saying how much they respect you and look up to you. So really appreciate you joining us today at the Benchmaker Summit. My pleasure, Noah.